that's what I found with an academic education. I am an education department fascinated by the next group. Uh, it's your normal now. My sister in law was a school, was two, school superintendent here in Connecticut. You like? Simsbury, Connecticut. Diane Olman. Uh, anyway, she's now with this international consulting firm. She goes around the world and certifies credits uh, English language in international schools. And she's even Zoom during the COVID. She even did some of the, the Zoom. Would this be nice to come to school? Yeah, but she was. What? International school. That's amazing. Not the way we do it. Even in Nepal. But the majority of our country. I've never seen it. Most. Yeah. And most closely to the country. I, I bet the good part is really the talk is push screen go. Screen go. go. And just make sure you're close to it uh, versus that's the school we get to the school for. Okay. Thank you, who will help the people here in the room, everybody else in the room. Thanks. Can you turn those lights or not? You can't see. They won't be on the live stream. Living on the stage ain't easy, Alex. Hmm? Being famous on the stage isn't easy. <laughs> but you're letting it go. So you want to be out. <laughs> Are we live now? Okay, cool. Good evening. I'm Alan Edelkind. I'm the school board representative from Dublin. And I do want to preface my prepared remarks. Normally when I do presentations, I do them from memory. And it works really well with the audience as with me. The problem I run into when I do that is I tend to go longer and longer and longer. And that's not why you're here tonight. We have a lot of important things that will be going on tonight. We have the presentations, questions, answers, and that's the important portion of this forum. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read my notes. This way, I keep on track and we can get to the meat of the entire forum. To first note, I am only one of many folks who have worked together as a team to put together what we feel will be a successful first community forum. I want to thank the school board, administration, and the Conval community, <clears throat> both in person and online, for giving their valuable time to attend the community forum. I really do want to thank you. But there is a question that needs to be answered. It's a simple one. Why do we want a community forum? And the simple answer is two words, dialogue and transparency. It's to have an open, transparent dialogue between the school board, administration, and you, the Conval community, on topics that have been selected by the Conval community to be most important. In the communication and the survey sent out to all, we committed to take the top four community ranked topics of the seven proposed ones and prepare for a formal presentation with time for questions and answers. And we looked at it. And with so many close rankings, we decided to add an additional fifth highly ranked topic to be included in the presentations and questions and answers. So we will have five topics that will be presented in three segments. The community forum is divided into two one-hour sections. The first for the presentation and questions and answers, and the second is for open questions from the audience 
for the school board administration to respond to. Details of this will be explained by Tim Burge, the forum moderator. What I'd like to do now is take a minute and introduce the members of the school board and the administration who are present on the stage. The first, and you just raise your hand so the people can see who you are. Dr. Stephen Ullman from Antrim, school board representative from Antrim. Rich Calhoun is not here right now, but he will be. Kira Christian, school board represent, re representative from Bennington. Kevin Post, school board representative from Francistown. Tim Taburge, school board representative from Hancock, school board chair and moderator. He's got a lot of things going on. Then you have, <coughs> excuse me, Janine Lessa, the vice chair, she's from Peterborough. Jim Fredrickson, school board representative from Sharon. And Elizabeth Swan, school board representative from Temple. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Kimberly Rizzo Saunders, the superintendent of school, and Dr. Ann Forrest. Is she here right now? She's upstairs. Okay, she'll be in soon. Those are the people who will be doing the pre present, presenting and answering questions. <clears throat> Interesting, when we were in the formative stages of developing this community forum, I let a good number of my friends and associates on Facebook know what we were doing. Sent them a post, said, this is what, as a school board, we plan on doing. Some were teachers, administrators, school board members, or community folks. They live all over the country. Most of them gave me a thumbs up and said, great. More than a few of them asked if we were crazy to have a community forum that is in so many communities have turned out to be contentious, non-productive, shouting matches, screaming, swearing, physical altercations, etc. Basically, they've turned out badly. I thought about what, was, what they wrote and I said to myself, yes, folks are passionate, they're intense, they're strongly focused in their thoughts and opinions. They should be. The decisions we make affect the most important aspects of their lives. Their home, their home lives, their pocketbooks, and most importantly, their children. But I believe our community know that with, their, with all their feelings and thoughts, that being civil to others is the right way to go. Not being civil only leads folks to focus on how things are said and not what information the speaker is trying to convey and are, um, <coughs> excuse me, really counterproductive, if you think about it, to any meaningful dialogue. As a last point, it's important to note that due to COVID pandemic, this has been the most intense time that can be imagined. Constant changing situations, changing and conflicting governmental guidance and directives, remote access, masks, vaccines, on and on. Things never imagined or thought of before. All needed to be considered in every decision while we are providing a safe, healthy, cost-effective, edu educationally rich environment for all of our students and children. Can every decision made by the entire community be happy for the entire community, make the whole community happy? No. But it's important to realize that we all live in the same towns and want the same things for our community and children. Why? Very simple and very straightforward because we all are Conval. I want to take the turn now to turn this forum over to Tim Thaburge, our moderator. Thank you, and have a great first community forum. Thank you. All right, so thank you, Alan. Um, so uh, given the fact that we don't have the 100 people that uh, potentially were going to come, um, I was a little bit more concerned that we would run out of time. So 
Uh, to be clear on what's going to happen, so we have some of our prepared presentations that we'll go through. At the end of each of those, you'll be able to ask questions uh, about what was presented and stuff like that. So that'll be the first half. And then after that will be the open one where you can step up uh, and ask any other questions you want. Um, so as we described, there may be times where uh, you ask a question we may not have considered before. Uh, my job as moderator will be to then potentially ask you follow-up questions to make sure we're actually getting uh, the, the, the full question or the issue that you're trying to uh, bring up. Um, uh, related to that, um, if it's a specific question about specific staff people or your specific student, um, this probably isn't the best <laughs> forum um, for that. Um, but uh, so I would just caution you on on uh, how much of that uh, you want to go down the road on. Um, uh, what else? Um, I think that's it. Alan said it best. Um, thank you very much for coming tonight. We know that you have to take time out of your day to come here and join us. Uh, we really do hope this is the start of a uh, quarterly series of forums uh, where the public gets to interact with us in a little bit more informal uh, manner than is at the board meetings, which I know can be uh, frustrating um, to many people. Uh, the board meetings, you know, as we do say, um, are for us to conduct the business of the district. Um, public comment is optional. Uh, we believe strongly in it. That's why we have uh, public comment sessions, uh, but they're not actually required. Um, but we do want to make sure that those are always part of our, of our meetings. So, um, uh, with that, again, thank you very much uh, to all of you for coming uh, tonight. So, obviously, one of the first big issues uh, that uh, is never short of opinions um, is our uh, masking policies and our return uh, to school policies. So, if you haven't seen it before, uh, this is the, the why masks part and why everything else part. So, uh, this is the Swiss cheese um, concept of epidemiology and uh, stopping uh, viral spread, uh, so that no one of these on its own is enough. So you'll see on here, it's a little hard to read probably from where you are, but there's social distancing up here, there's mask use up here, there's, uh, you know, limiting indoor time. Uh, if it's crowded, there's avoiding touching your face, there's good hand washing, there's uh, vaccines. So there's all of these different slices of cheese um, are uh, part of the process of limiting viral spread and exposure. And then they fall into two different ones. The ones on the left here are those personal responsibilities, and then the ones on the right are our shared responsibilities. Um, and that is how we get through of this, is by a combination of both of those, both what you choose to do as an individual and then what our shared responsibilities are as well. So this is really how to look at uh, the different things that we've done, uh, whether it be through the outdoor learning that we've done through our distancing policies, through the mask policies that we've adopted, uh, through the vaccine clinics we've held at schools to try to encourage folks to do that as well, right? Uh, so there's that. So uh, what happened? So obviously back in March of 2020, when this all began, is when we first went to um, remote. Uh, we learned a lot uh, from that. Um, we came back in the fall of 2020, uh, offering in-person instruction uh, from day one. Uh, we did have use of pods and cohorts, again, uh, the high school was the most limiting of those due to the six foot, um, the six foot spacing limited the fact that we could only have about half of the students in at the time. Um, it's worth pointing out that as soon as we could bring the entire school back in, we did, and that was as soon as that was reduced down to uh, the three foot uh, recommendation. Um, many students, I will point out, did continue to stay remote uh, for the entire year. Um, so. Uh, that was about 20% or so of our student body stayed remote the entire year uh, that year, even when they had the option uh, to come back the whole uh, time. Uh, as we got later into that year and the school board started looking towards what this year uh, would look like, um, we absolutely believed that we wanted to return to as normal a posture um, as possible. I think we had great hope that the availability of uh, the vaccines that were expected uh, would, gra would greatly contribute to our ability uh, to do that. Uh, so, um, where are we now? Uh, so we have modified our pods cohort stuff. Uh, they do exist, they exist in the background um, in case the spread gets worse and we had to take other action. Uh, so uh, that is there. Uh, we still have tents up for some outdoor learning. Uh, we ended our, our busing approach uh, that was used uh, last year. Obviously we still have uh, challenges uh, this year, but not related to that. 
uh, related to shortage of uh, drivers. Uh, if anyone's interested, we, we can get you a, an application. Um, I thought I would be driving next week, but we got a budget, so I'm good. Um, uh, again, our approach is to absolutely do everything we can to maximize in-person learning. Uh, we heard that loud and clear from the community. I think those of us that are parents felt the same way. Um, we absolutely want to do everything we can to maximize in-person instruction by reducing, uh, reducing spread. And that our mask policies would be based on a combination of uh, community spread, vaccination rates, um, and other factors, and that we would not require masks outside. Right. Um, this is what that looked like in our plan, where we had blue and then green, and then yellow and then red. So uh, how did we get uh, to green? So all summer we were in blue because the uh, numbers for the great, greater Monadnock Public Health region uh, were well below 100. We hit 100 uh, right around August 12th. Uh, which is the same day we met and went uh, to green. On September 24th, um, so earlier last week, uh, the region peaked at about 465 per 100,000. Um, the number that was reported yesterday, I hope is real, um, it was a massive drop off uh, to 242. So let's hoping that trend continues. Uh, that means we would then potentially be able to move back into blue and remove the masking uh, requirements. So uh, I just want to make sure this is what was in our, what was in our uh, plan. And obviously, we want to do everything we can uh, to stay in blue or green so that we're always in-person instruction. Um, relative to those numbers, the other stuff we look at isn't just how many cases there are in our towns, but where are those cases? Are they at? Um, are they clustered? Are they in the schools? Are they in the, um, uh, what do you call it, assisted living facilities we have in town, right? Are they clustered or is it, or is it widespread? Is it a particular school? Is it a particular town? Um, what does the uh, hospital have for capacity? How stretched are their resources? Those are all of the other things that we consider uh, when deciding whether we're going to go uh, into which different um, phases, right? Uh, okay. Uh, Kira. You can either stand up tall or not. So that one will move your slide to the right. Hi, everybody. So we were um, going over the presentations and trying to figure out who's going to present what. And we decided that Tim and I were actually really presenting on very similar topics. Um, so we kind of just meshed it into one presentation and go from there. Um, so number one, please don't send your kids to school sick. I know there's sometimes it's just a cough, it's just a sore throat, it's just a little bit of a headache. Those are all symptoms of COVID. So we don't know for sure if it's just a cold, if it's allergies, if it's COVID. So if they have these things, please don't send them sick. Just it's safer that way. If you know for sure that it's allergies, you have a doctor's note, you've got something on paper, that's fine. Make sure that we, you know, the schools have documentation of that. That's really helpful so that we know. Um, but really just use, use some good judgment there and make sure that if, if your children are sick, they're staying home, they're getting the rest they need, they're drinking fluids, they're taking naps, they're watching prices right, all those things that we like to do when we're sick, right? It's always prices right, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> How many hosts have we been through? So there are some protocols with coming back to school in the event of somebody in your household, somebody in your family, somebody maybe having a confirmed case of COVID-19. So there's a little bit of a difference between those who are vaccinated and those who are not vaccinated. And this has to do with carrying a viral load. If you're vaccinated, you're carrying less of the viral load because your body's more able to fight the viral load. So you're less able to transmit. You can still, however, that is what the science is saying. So close household contacts with somebody diagnosed with COVID-19 are required to quarantine if they are not fully vaccinated. That does mean that the vast majority of the children in our school system 
are gonna have to quarantine if somebody in their house has a confirmed case of COVID. That kind of stinks, so we get it. They can return to school after they get a negative COVID test, um, which would be five days after their last exposure. So if someone in the house has a confirmed case, they're still experiencing symptoms, that's still exposure. It doesn't mean from the day those symptoms started. So just a little clarity there. And then it's a 10-day quarantine period from that last day of exposure. If the student is lucky enough to be vaccinated, they don't have to quarantine in the event somebody in their house is a confirmed, does have a confirmed case of COVID-19. So they, we do still recommend some testing in three to five days just to make sure, um, and wearing a face covering in all indoor settings until, you know, they receive a negative test result or for 14 days. Obviously, you want to watch for symptoms. So it's fairly straightforward, sort of, clear as mud, right? So as far as um, students who are dismissed or they're out on a sick day because they're experiencing symptoms, um, they're going to be instructed to self-isolate at home for 10 days, contact health provider, get a negative test. If they receive a negative test and their fevers are going down and they're feeling pretty good and they're ready to come back, they can come back to school after they're fever-free for 24 hours and they, their symptoms have improved. So if testing isn't done, there's at least 10 days from the start of on, the onset of symptoms and also they should be fever-free and symptoms improved for 24 hours. Um, if it's symptoms of a non-COVID related injury, that's where that really helpful doctor's note comes into play. If we know that the student is allergic to ragweed, ragweed's out right now. So um, a note from the doctor can really help with, you know, I know this kid has itchy eyes and a sore throat and is coughing a lot. It's ragweed, look, here's a note from the doctor. Um, so it's really gonna be helpful to have cleared to come back to school. And then this is probably the smallest thing you will see on the screen today, <laughs> I hope, for your sake. So this is a roadmap for students and employees. Everyone's following this. This is available on the website, Dr. Saunders. Is this up anywhere? So that it's the nurses have it, so they okay. can send it home. We can make it available on the website. Okay. Um, so if, if you wanted to reference this, it did come from the DHHS to, um, website in New Hampshire. And following the flow chart, again, clear as mud, fairly straightforward, all these words on the page in pretty little boxes. But this goes for students and staff. So there's not different protocols based on how old you are, what building you're in, anything like that. If a child or a staff member develops new or unexplained symptoms of COVID-19. Again, going back, you know, they have allergies. We have that, we know that, it's documented. Uh, that's not a new or unexplained symptom, right? So it's new or unexplained symptoms of COVID-19. Don't come to school. If you get tested, it's negative, you may come back. If you get tested, it's positive, you gotta stay home and isolate. So you guys have all seen a flow chart before, right? This isn't new, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, the, the red means you, you kind of, you got to stay put, you got to chill at home, watch that Price is Right, enjoy your, your nightly tea. Um, so if your home, the child or household contact is home with symptoms, then there's some vaccinated, unvaccinated stuff um, regarding testing and how long you need to stay home for if it's somebody in your household. Now again, that is like an overnight shared household experience. So if you're, you know, a family where the child is splitting time between two households and they stay at one of those households, that's a household, that counts. Um, if the family is maybe staying with a grandparent for a while and the grandparent has it, that's a household too. So um, just something to be aware of. It's, it's kind of where you're spending the bulk of your time. So, and I think that is the end of this one. All right, questions. So if you have questions, you can step up to the mic related to any of the stuff that we've presented thus far um, and ask questions or seek clarification of anything uh, on that one. This would be the time uh, to do that. Sure. And then just tell us who you are, where you're from. Oh, my 
excited to be the first. Can I move it down a little bit so I don't feel like I'm... Oh, sure. I can't see you anyway. Oh, so. okay. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just not that tall. Uh, my name is Erin Nolan, and I'm from Peterborough. I have four children in the school district. I do want to thank you all for doing this community uh, forum. I think it's, it's really helpful, especially for those of us who attend the school board meetings fairly regularly or try to. Um, it can be really frustrating to not be able to um, have dialogue with you guys. So I think this is really great. Um, the first, am I allowed to ask two questions? In yeah, this? sure. Okay. I'll judge whether the second one's worthy of a follow-up. Okay, no, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, both, it's on the same subject. <laughs> So my first question is, and and I know that I've had discussions with um, with folks about this before, but I'm still very confused about why we are using the public health region data instead of the numbers in the actual towns. And I'm confused about this for a couple of reasons. But the first one is, if we just use those daily town numbers that are released from the state, mm -hmm. we could still potentially be in blue phase and not on the cusp of yellow. So as of today, you're twice, the local numbers are actually um, significantly higher than the regional numbers. In so that the, public health region that you guys use that? Yep. Manana, so if, if I take the numbers of new cases from the towns of Conval right now and calculate those the same way they calculate that for the greater public health region, right now that's at 242. We're at 335, 350. In the nine towns? Again, it's a it's a rate per hundred thousand people. Okay, I guess it's how that's cal you have to because that's how that's all done. It's all calculated by a rate. You can't just take it as per case. I mean, you, state. you could, but that doesn't. You're then not comparing like to like. Okay. So, Messinic, for example, Messinic's policy was ten cases, and so now they they're in a position where they're going to go masks on, masks off, masks on, masks off. Mass on, mass off, and that could vary week to week or day to day. Yes, I actually was at the um, the SMS that's, girls so that's volleyball what they, game today. That's what Messinic <laughs> was masked chose. off today. That's what Messinic chose to do. But Monday it will be mass on. See that? So <laughs> I, I was informed. Right. I mean, that's. <laughs> uh, I would suggest to you, as somebody that's done public policy for twenty three years, that's a. Uh, no offense to Messinic, that's no, not a okay. great way to approach that. No, and I, uh, the parents I think, were frustrated. But, it. I I can understand where you're coming so from. So that so that's. <laughs> So that's why, and the other comment I think we've repeatedly said is uh, we did it that way because we're not in a bubble. Um, people don't only stay in these nine, they're a great nine towns, uh, but people don't only stay in those towns. Our employees don't only come from those towns. People travel outside of those towns. So we felt that the greater Monadnock region was geographically more similar to us than um, the bigger counties to the to the east of us, so we thought it was a fair uh, comparison to Conville, which do, is why we did that. I do appreciate that we weren't included with Man Manchester Nashua because then right. we, you know, Wish you, I remote. think we can both agree that yes. it's not the right. We are we are not that right. Right, that's okay. absolutely right, and we definitely agree on that. that so we, we think we that. look more like Swansea, more like the other ones in you know Jaffrey and 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 those than we do. I will reluct I will reluctantly acquiesce that point. But <laughs> my next statement, I'll move off that is um, when she was just speaking and talking about, um, you know, if um, your child has symptoms to keep them home. Pretty much everything is a COVID symptom. So are we, is our real goal here to test every kid with a sniffle? Because if I, let's say I called in and I said, my son has a slight cough. What would the recommendation to me be yeah, under, to test my kid? Under our policies, that would, that's because that's still, because they haven't narrowed it down in terms of what the definitive ones are. So if the research said it's these three, the, all of the guidance would shift to that. That hasn't happened yet. Okay. So in this case, are staff members with a slight cough or a sniffle staying home? Are also not supposed to be reporting to school. There's, okay. Everyone is supposed to be subject to that same, to okay, those same checks. Can I say like... As entering cold and flu season, how unrealistic this kind of is. I, and I would also then encourage you to get your flu shot. I mean, all right. So okay. <laughs> okay. I, um, I got mine the other day. My, my last point on the same subject is uh, the documenting of random symptoms. Like I said, and we all will, maybe we all don't agree, but there are many, many symptoms that can be attributed to COVID. If you had taken your child to the pediatrician for years and years and you've never brought up that your child has seasonal allergies because they were so mild, you never felt that that was something to bring them to the doctor over. Suddenly now you're in a mad panic to get a 
sheet that claims your child's had seasonal allergies, I, I feel like that puts a lot on parents. I understand, like, if your kid's, you know, hacking and coughing everywhere, don't send them to school. But it's the change of seasons, and the ragweed's terrible. You know, if my child has itchy eyes, I feel like I'm not rushing to CVS to get him a test. No, fair, fair. So, I, I mean, I guess it's just it was a statement. I, no, once no, again, appreciate it that you guys did this, and I am grateful to have the dialogue, and I thank you, and we'll relinquish the mic to the next speaker. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. That was an ideal exchange. So if you could all just follow that example, it will be great. Question? Yeah, sure. Again, who you are, where you're from, and if you have kids in the district or not. Sure. Uh, Mackenzie Nichols from Peterborough, and I do have a son at uh, Peterborough Elementary. Um, I have two questions as well, um, or I guess a question and a statement. Okay. If um, a, I'm not saying this is happening, but if a parent were to call their child out because of a mental health day or they want to go somewhere, will they truly nope. be allowed to do that? Yep. Or is it so the nurses, the nurse, they'll, they're very specific. If you've ever called the number to call out your child, they're I very know. specific for why, and they're yep. asking you for that. So are they out because of my, my own child has had mental sure. health days? Okay. So that, nope, no problem. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I've heard yeah. in other areas that it, that's how it used to be, and I have done mental health days, and they've been very successful. I just wanted to make sure that that was still happening. I'm a huge fan of, in general, everyone taking mental yeah. health days. So if you have leave, <laughs> never leave it on the table with your employer. Um, and secondly, I just want to echo Aaron's concern, too. I mean, it brings up to me the concern of we already have very little substitutes. Yeah. Um, and it does make me concerned that not only for um, students, but for staff, that if we do start every little headache, I mean... We know there's teachers, they're stressed, there's deadlines, they have a headache, and if they truly have to go out for all of these things, our students are the ones that are suffering sure. um, because they're going to be unstaffed. And I will point back to the chart where there are key differences for those that have given taken the option that's available to them, and 90-some-odd percent of our staff um, have elected to get vaccinated, so that changes So if dynamic. you're vaccinated, you don't get headache, no, or if you get a no, headache, you don't that. have to get I'm tested? I'm just saying it changes the... Um, it changes the uh, response and the quarantining stuff. So it's n you're not... But you still have to be tested, which means still time off of work, which still means low staffing. Correct, correct, right. But yeah, okay, just clarifying. Like, it's just a concern Absolutely that correct. Yep. I think we're already so short buses, you know, all those things, and, and I just think all... And, and if the entire district were 80% vaccinated, we'd be having a different conversation. Yes and no, because... Because we... So the, yeah, can you explain that? So DHHS has provided different guidance that talks about when you can uh, take different protocols based on confirmed vaccination rates per building. Can you elaborate as to what those might, how they might differ? So if, DHHS has suggested that you don't need masks in a building where you can verify an 80% vaccination rate. Correct. So would that change testing with symptoms? I don't know. I okay. presume other stuff would follow that. I okay. don't have that answer. I, I think that's what we would... For the record, none of our buildings are there. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so we, yeah. we don't even have to have those next conversations right. yet. But yeah. That's correct. It was on that matrix that we removed because it was horribly confusing. <laughs> at the bottom of that matrix, it had like four different, um, what do you call it, asterisks at the bottom. And one of them had to do with confirmed vaccination rates. Um, if by chance the DHHS is listening, I'm still waiting for a response to my email that I sent 32 days ago. So... Uh, sure. So, Who you are, where you're from, do you I'm, have kids in the my school? My name's Brittany Gerard. Hi, Brittany. I have four kids in the district, but we're currently not in the district. We chose to homeschool. We're from Antrim. Okay. Um, I'm reading off of something. So, okay. um, the school board has mentioned multiple times that if a building achieves an 80% vaccination rate, masking could be removed. Right. When will we include naturally achieved antibodies in these numbers? It's no secret that cases are popping up daily in all of the schools among all ages. If 80% of school building staff and students combined have either had the vaccine or tested positive for COVID, therefore having natural antibodies, will that change moving forward? And if not, then why? Uh, so I don't know. The recommendation from DHHS, which are the medical professionals right now, is a vaccination rate. They haven't issued any guidance relative to natural um, immunity from having had it. It can't be considered at all, especially with all of the... That's, if they were to have it in their criteria, I think we would we could add that to our considerations, but that's not on their recommendations right now. Okay, so can we propose it somehow? Or maybe 
uh, so again, I, realistically, it's never gonna. There's no way an elementary school is ever going to get 80 percent. I mean, it it could by the end of November. Well, no, why not? Not by my kids, but no. Okay, but but again, that the choice is there, right? Right. So, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So natural antibodies, though. You I, know, I don't. D, the medical professionals at DHHS haven't suggested that as an option yet. Okay. I wish there was a better answer, but okay. Uh, Thank you. I'm not a medical professional. There. Is that sorry? Yeah. Sorry, what? I can't see anyone other than the front row. Oh, sorry, in the purple. Wait, I can see you now. Is this what it's like to act on stage? Uh -huh. Oh, this is brutal. It takes the pressure off of you. It sure does, Ned. I can't see any of you. I don't know if you're angry, happy. Well, we've got masks on. Right see, that's now. even better, right? It's, it's I'm going to paint a smiley face yeah. on every mask now. You can imagine my smile. Okay. Okay. I'm Jessica. I have three kids in the district. Okay. We homeschooled all of last year. We were hoping that by the time we return, the masking would be over, things would be calmer. In my opinion, this is not calmer. But I have one question to start out with, and that is, what is the board's opinion on asymptomatic spread? And I will follow that up with, we were one of the families in HES that came down with COVID. We all tested positive. My son, who had probably had the first symptom, which was so mild we didn't notice it, so mild, was positive. Sorry, what? You didn't the, hear question the question is very, very basic. What is your opinion as a board on asymptomatic spread? I'm not sure that the board hasn't discussed the specific issue of asymptomatic spread. Well, then I think you should. Okay. And I would really like an opinion as soon as possible because it affects every discussion we're having here. Can you describe to me what that discussion would look like? Well, admitting is a strong word and it sounds too negative, but acknowledging that asymptomatic spread is occurring in the schools right. would have to make us address how is that happening. And then we would either have to get a whole lot more serious about how we stop that spread or acknowledge that in children, this is a mild illness. And a vaccine is not a magic bullet to end this for the few people, the few youngsters who have a serious reaction. And Saying that that's few youngsters does not diminish their suffering, but it also adds some reality to the discussion we're having where we're pretending that everyone's about to die. And some people, this is a deadly disease, but it is not the majority, the overwhelming majority of our children. And that's a discussion point that is overlooked in all the discussions I've heard from the White House on down to this meeting. So asymptomatic spread is a critically important thing for you to have an opinion on so that we can then deal with the consequences of that. So again, I just want to make clear. So you, uh, no, I, I, I generally want to know what you, so our opinion, well, you want us to have a discussion where we would make a motion that says what? We acknowledge that asymptomatic spread exists? Well, since the, the asymptomatic spread, in my observation, is occurring at a high rate, sure. and we are testing at a much lower rate, right we may be able to put in perspective what is actually the effect of COVID on our schools, which may be a more of a high effect on the teachers who are in older age category or wider range. Meaning it's probably much higher than is currently reported. Precisely. Right. So if, if, I, if again, I'm not the governor, but if I were, one of the things I would have done was make sure that there was testing available in all of our schools, but he didn't do that. So, sure. And neither did the commissioner of education. Sure. So. But, oh, sorry, I think... So I just want to clarify that there is a program called Safer at School that does randomized testing, um, it, but it does not te necessarily test symptomatic students. It just randomized tests. Every parent would have to give permission. So You have to opt um, in. You have to opt in. So I just want to make sure you all knew that that does exist. Sure. And that is something. Um, my family with... I think a day and a half of illness missed 30 days of school, and if we hadn't tested my son, it would have been 40 days, like that. We had less than two weeks of school so far this year because of a positive test that was a day and a half of illness, which, by the way, the family, and I can go in on this in further detail, but I think that's probably between the school and us, we're fairly sure my son picked up at school during a meeting where at lunch, the kids were put in a small office to eat lunch together in a room without windows. So 
again, we either have to get much more serious or acknowledge that this is not the most mild childhood illness, but relatively mild. And that maybe what we're doing, especially to elementary school kids, kindergartners, is overkill. And I speak again about the children who are learning to speak and enunciate and may have speech problems. Two of mine do. They cannot see their teacher's mouth move and the teacher cannot see their mouth move. And this is a problem. And I wonder how long are we going to accept this? And the idea that I've heard from the board is that, well, as long as enough get vaccinated, that's never gonna happen for my family. You're gonna keep making them wear a mask or when are we gonna wait for that to happen? By then we're a year or two later. That's too late. So I would like to hear again about the asymptomatic spread, which we can minimize and say, oh, what would you like? It's fundamental to all of this that we're discussing. We are missing the forest for the one tree. Thank you for your time. Dr. Alman, you have to unmute your mic. Okay. If, if, the, if there were evidence of, of uh, significant trans, transmission of COVID by asymptomatic students, what policy should the school board adopt in light of that, that finding? She said she'd like to at least hear discussion on it. And it doesn't, the discussion doesn't have to happen right now, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. We're good. See, that's why this is more informal. It's better this way, right? <laughs> Thought I was done. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, I don't have the answer, yeah, but I right. know, in my opinion and from my personal observations with three kids who have now tested positive, been healthy at home, been bouncing around like crazy, waiting to go back to school, I see the impact of overkill. My son, seven years old, says he's concerned about the next time he gets kicked out of school. That's his words, not mine. His opinion, I'm, si I'm not sick, totally healthy, I feel fine. I'm not allowed to go back to school, I'm like kicked out of school. His words, kicked out. That's not words he's getting from the teachers, but that's how he feels. So asymptomatic spread, yes, my son, right? And probably to a certain extent my daughters. And no doubt many of their classmates. All right, thanks. Um, so my name is Diana Greer. I'm a resident of Peterborough. I have two children in the district, and I also work for the Nashua School District. So I know as a middle school teacher that I um, am under certain protocols myself with masking. So if I have students who are improperly wearing their masks, it's a couple warnings for them, and then I have to send them out of my classroom because it's my responsibility as a teacher Unfortunately, not to just teach my content, but also keep my students safe, whether that's in the event of an active shooter, a fire, or in the event of a pandemic. So I am under the protocol, again, to send my students to the office. Sometimes it's a conversation. They're in the office for the day. Sometimes students have to get sent home for not following the safety protocols in the district. So I'm wondering what kind of protocols we have for students who are consistently not wearing their masks properly. Because again, even if it's asymptomatic, symptomatic spread, we know that masks is an important tool. I know that you know my daughter has mentioned as a first grader that she has classmates who have issues wearing their masks and have to continue to be told to pull them up. Um, there was a picture even posted by the Peterborough Elementary School of a student with his magic milk experiment and his mask below his nose. So I'm just wondering what kind of protocols the each kind of school is held to when it comes to consistency with the masks. So students get the same, a similar as what you're describing. We warn them, we warn them, we warn them. Um, just like I'm sure you're doing at your school, our teachers do the very best they can to keep their eyes on all of their students at all times. We have teachers in the hallways reminding students to put their mask up or put their mask on. So that we're doing the same thing so far. We are, are fortunate and we have only had to call parents once regarding mask use. Okay, and I do wanna also mention that I know that we do have New Hampshire children currently in the hospital because of COVID. And it's not just the, it's not just the children that we're thinking about in their symptoms, but it's the children who could be bringing this home to their families, their unvaccinated siblings, like my son who's one and a half. 
So I always appreciate when we can do everything to keep everyone safe. So thank you. Alan, I'm way over time. <laughs> but it's great discussion, so I'm going to let it go. Anyone else on this one before we go to the next one? Shirt in the gray sweatshirt in the corner. Hi. We'll do uh, this as the last one on this one, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jim for his. And then if there's anything left, you can bring it up in the next hour. Good deal? Okay, great. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no problem. I'll be brief. Um, so I'm Emily. I, I'm in Francistown. I have a daughter who's in first grade at Francistown Elementary and a younger daughter who will be starting preschool in Antrim next week. Um, and I just have a brief comment that I just really want to thank the board and um, all of the school district staff and faculty um, for having these really conscientious COVID standards. Um, so my family was living in Texas um, up until August. And for any of you who have been following the national news, you'll know that things have just been kind of a disaster in Texas. Um, so right leading up until the start of the school year, um, we knew that our school district was going to have zero COVID policies. And that was not something that we were comfortable with as a family. Um, so we came to Francistown because we have family here and because of the, you know, again, really conscientious and thoughtful and data-driven, scientifically based um, COVID policies. And we've been so grateful that we can send our daughters to school in safe environments. My husband and I both work full time. Uh, we homeschooled our daughters last year because we had no choice. And obviously that's not ideal. Um, so we've had, we've been really grateful um, that they can go to school and be safe and our daughter's really happy to be back in school full time. She's thrilled when she gets off the bus every day. Um, so I just want to thank the community also for welcoming us um, in the couple of months that we've been here. So that was it. Thank you. Thanks. Welcome to Conville. Thanks. Jim. Thank you. In the interest of full disclosure, I want to admit that uh, when Alan asked me to give a presentation of the budget, I said yes. When he told me it was, when he, when it was, when he told me it was going to follow the mass discussion, I requested a mental health day, and I was denied. <laughs> so what I'm going to try to do is answer the two questions that are on the screen. How is the budget paid for, and what happens to the money not spent? Two very good questions, but they're not simple answers. So bear with me as I try to go through this, and I try to educate people on, on the budget and how it works. Um, I've been on the school board a little over five years from now. When I got on the school board. I knew how to spell school budget. That's about the extent of my knowledge. So I think it's important that everybody understands how it all works. So we're going to talk a little bit first about the budget process. It actually starts with the board. School board, our two main, our two main responsibilities are budget and policy. So we start the process every year by providing the guidance on the budget to the superintendent. We tell, we tell Kimberly what we'd like to see in the next budget. Then Kimberly and her staff goes off and develops it. After she develops it, we review it thoroughly. It takes probably a several month process. We actually provided the budget guidance, what, formally a week or so ago? And then we will have, I guess in the first, uh, first weekend of November, we'll have, a, we'll have a, um, a review, a Saturday seance, so to speak, and we'll go over the budget in detail. The thing that's important is the, the board reviews, we don't develop the budget, but we do review it, modify, and approve it. It's important to understand, and forgive me, I got Parkinson's, so I can't help my hand. I'm not nervous, okay? I, I can either shake the clicker or the microphone, one of the two. <laughs> so the, the important thing to understand in the budget, and this is important for later on, when I've tried to build this story, I, there is, there is, I, could, I could try to give a short answer, but there's so much more involved that I tried to paint the full picture here. So revenues and expenses, when we develop the budget, are estimated. Very important word. One thing that we have to do is our proposed the expenses that we propose have to equal the estimated revenues. There's no deficit spending allowed in school districts. Okay. The operating budget can be modified by district voters at the deliberative session. How many of you come to the high school in February and, and listen to us and had an opportunity to talk and modify the budget? You have that opportunity. Take advantage of it. The operating budget is subject to voter approval. 
The board needs to approve it, the voters approve it, okay? So no budget happens without your full approval. Again, the, the voters appropriate, what well, we use the term we call the appropriate the expenses, they do not approve the revenues. We're gonna go to revenues in a second, so all you can do is approve the expenses. The actual expenses, I already said this, cannot exceed actual revenues. Then at the end of the fiscal year closes, there's a reconciliation and audit being performed. So if you look at the, the final bullet in the slide, the process takes two and a half years. We just started the budget guidance for fiscal year 23. We're wrapping up fiscal year 21. So there's three budget years in play at any given, well right now there's happen to be three budget years in play. So how does that impact your, this, what's the schedule and how does that impact your taxes? The fiscal year, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the fiscal year 22, which is the current school year. That was approved by the budget, by the voters in March. The school year runs from July 1st to June 30th. We call it FY22. The Articles of Agreement stipulates how we allocate what is called the district assessment. And I'm gonna get that in a second. So, by the way, there's gonna be a pop quiz at the end on this. <laughs> Anything highlighted in color is important, okay? Number two pencils only. So the local, local education portion of your preliminary, preliminary tax bills is based on the approved budget using estimated district assessment. Your tax, you get two tax bills a year. If you look at them, there's four pieces. There's county taxes, town taxes, and two education taxes. One is state, one's local. We're talking about the local education piece. It's the biggest piece, but that's what we control. So right now, as we speak, the fiscal year 21 revenues and expenses are being audited. They're not final yet, correct? Okay, I will make sure my business manager back there agrees with what I just said. In the local education portion of your final tax bill, as issued in December, you'll see it in December, will be adjusted based on the audit and when the audit's final and we're gonna actually be returning money to the towns. Again, highlighted in color, pay attention. The towns actually collect the taxes for the district and sent monthly payments to the district. You probably read the paper the other day. <laughs> no, they, all, they all pay, we just had to adjust theirs, okay? That was an unfortunate incident as we all know. So how is it paid for? So I'm not gonna do bullet at a time, I'm gonna do, I did two bullets, no I didn't, here we go. So this is how it's paid for, partially. This is the fiscal year 22 revenue sources, and you can see just the big bullets, local revenue, state revenue, federal revenue, and then a state education tax. Okay, look, well, under local revenue, notice I highlighted the unreserved fund balance, $250,000. Remember that when we get to the second question, how fiscal, about fiscal year 21 money not spent, okay? State revenue, I got highlighted in red. Ad adequacy grant, how many know, how many can guess what that's all about? Or lawsuit with the state? State adequacy grant is based on in round numbers $4,000 per student. It costs 18,000 plus per student. So the, the Board of Education, School board here several years ago sued the state saying basically you are not meeting your constitutional requirements to fund <coughs> inadequate education. Okay, that doesn't answer the question in terms of where's the money gonna come from, but they're not doing their job by the state constitution. That's how we feel and that's why we sued them. We'll see how that turns out. Federal revenue is about $2 million. It's the state education tax. That's the second portion of the taxes that is collected by the towns and given to us, okay? Remember I said there's two education taxes pieces. So the total estimated revenues is $14.8 million. Let's go to district assessment. So if you look at the proposed operational budget, it was about $51 million, $50 million. There's federal programs on top of that, you add them up, you get 52 million. Total estimated revenue is 14.8 million. The difference is big. That's what the local taxpayers have to pay, in property taxes, okay? It's a big number. In addition to, and that was Warren Article One, I didn't point that out. You voted on the budget. In addition, 
you voted to approve an extension of the collective bargain agreement worth $850,000. You agreed to fund the trust funds, another $700,000. So the total approved budget is 54 million and the total district assessment is $39 million. Okay, it's a big number. You all see in your property taxes, but it's not all that bad because we don't always spend all the money. Okay, that's the second question. Oh, what happens to the money not spent? There's restrictions and guidelines from the state. Like I said before, deficit spending is not allowed. Some unspent funds can be encumbered in others. If we make, it, if we make an obligation to a contractor, like Tim makes an obligation to buy a truck, and the truck hasn't delivered by the end of the fiscal year, we haven't actually paid for it, but we've incurred an obligation, we have to keep that money and roll it over to the next year. That's what encumbered means. State laws and regulation define the use of unreserved, what we call unreserved funds. I'm not going to get into it, but we, we're, we're not, we don't have total flexibility in what we can do with that money. So what can we do with it? The voters have a say in how those funds are distributed. You voted $700,000 for trust fund. That comes first. If you read the Warren, article, Warren articles, it said if there's money left over for the trust funds, fund capital equipment, fund Healthcare, athletic fund, I think we have six funds we have right now. So that's first. There are some allowable uses of the so-called money not spent. I like that term. So what can we do? We can transfer to the district trust funds. I just told you that, $700,000. This is out of fiscal year, fiscal year 21 money. We can return some to the towns as local revenue in the following year. Go back to that previous slide, you saw local revenue, $250,000 estimate. Typical fund balance is typically, we put a budget together, it's $250,000. Actual amount of return in fiscal year 17, 18, and 19 was a lot bigger than that. That's good for the taxpayer. Remember, we can't be in a deficit spending situation. We don't want to, we don't want to have a budget that's too big if it's too small, we run the risk of running out of money and having to cut programs that we don't want to cut. So we come up with a reasonable number. Last year, not last year, fiscal year 20, because of COVID, for the first time the state gave, allowed us to retain some money. That was the emergency order 38. So there was $320,000 that we, re re we retained and 250,000 we returned. We returned what we said we would. We had a discussion on that. The board will have a discussion on each of these items during the year. If you go to our board meetings, you can, you can see it happening live. Real exciting stuff, right? So the fund balance. Fiscal year 21 was a year of challenge. Kimberly, you like that expression, I know that. So the, the budget was approved again. Did I just go backwards? No. Yeah, so the budget was approved. I, I just kind of want to remind everybody. The budget was approved in, in March 2020, and the state of emergency was declared in March 13th, three days after the budget was approved. The COVID response drove significant increase in our expenses. The school board took immediate action to reduce expenses. We did budget freezes. We met every, we had more, be, more board meetings after that. We had weekly board meetings for a while. The COVID related, the, st the feds and the state really came through for us, both in terms of money and the, the flexibility. They the helped feds, us out a bunch. The feds came through. Pardon? The feds came through. The only flexibility the state provided was the fact that we could reserve that. Well, okay, but I, no, I didn't want to debate that. But they did give us the did us emergency or 38. I, I think it's important. Yeah. So the money not spent fiscal year 21, I, I did this slide. Okay, so the voters approved transfer 700,000 to the district fund in June. Just recently, we announced that we're gonna return 3.2 million to the district. The preliminary month, so we did that in two ways. Normally, we wait till the, end, the tax bill comes out and reduce the next tax bill. What well, we decided because the number was gonna be so big, and Lori estimate, Lori and Kimberly estimated it's gonna be like over 3.2 million, we decided we can give a chunk of that back now. So what we did was we actually went Back to the towns and said, hey, you know, we told you before, pay this much a month, pay this much a month, okay? So why collect it and return it? 
The final monthly tax bills, once the audit's completed, will be reduced once we get the final numbers. And so the total district assessment is going to reduce from the 39.3 million to the 36 million I told you about. Okay? It's a significant reduction. It's about 10% reduction of the tax bill. Zero dollars is going to be retained by the district. Anything we don't spend, we give back. So I think I've answered the two questions. Really exciting presentation. But if you want, what would, one thing we've tried to do over the last couple of years, we've put a bunch of financial articles on the board website. How many of you guys have looked and seen them? Okay, they're, they're useful. They're in detail if you want to get in detail. If you just want to read the headlines, read the headline. But recognize that headlines don't tell the whole story. So we encourage you to, to look at these articles. We're going to have an article on this returning the money because there was, an, there was some controversy about that. I suspect I'm not going to have as many questions as the last one did. <laughs> yeah, again, who you are, where you're from. Yep. Thanks. And you can't see me smiling either. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephanie. Um, I live in Peterborough and I have two kids. Um, and again, like a lot of people said, I just applaud the board for encouraging productive and civil dialogue. It's been really heartbreaking to see the way these discussions have played out in other places. Um, and I just think this is a really nice opportunity. Um, my question is about the $100,000 that was approved at the last meeting for a remote teacher um, or a remote situation. Um, and I'm curious about um, what that number is based on, the $100,000, and if there's been any discussion about what that job description would look like or who could access that option. Um, and I guess a follow-up uh, about the board's opinion on teachers rooming and Zooming is the expression, you know, teaching in front and teaching online again, and if that would ever potentially uh, be required of the teachers in the district. Well, I was just advised that my mental health request was approved, so I'm going to let Kim. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for for the follow up, Stephanie. I think did you send did you send me an email? Yeah, and it's uh it's also been really I I'm it's great that you take the time to respond to people in a district this size with the amount of emails that I'm sure you get every day to get a response usually within 24 hours is kind of remarkable, um, given I guess the responsibility that I'm sure you have right now. Um, funny you mentioned that because my administrators and I were just talking about that today, uh, the 24-hour piece. Yeah. Um, so we look. So we estimate eighty-five thousand dollars for a teacher. Yeah. So eighty-five thousand um, dollars. We were looking for both somebody who potentially could be full time and somebody that could potentially work five to ten hours a week, which would have been the remaining fifteen. So that's where the original number came. But let me give you a little update on that now. What we are looking at right now is to do something more similar to what we've done in the past around homebound instruction. Yeah. So we are looking for tutors. So um, PSA, really quickly, unabashedly, um, we are still looking for at least one tutor. So if you're interested in tutoring remotely, please let me know or um, because there could be um, some, some work for you. But to get back to that, we, are, we, we presently have already started working with two tutors that can work pretty much seven to 12 would be their age group. What they'll be doing, what their responsibilities will be do, to do will be to work with students and with teachers and based on who the student is, they will be guiding and doing that, that Zoom back and forth, meeting with them and assisting them with their work because seven to 12, they get their work through Google. So at the elementary level, we can also send homework and that, that uh, Chromebook, um, but the, the person or people at the elementary level will need to be a little more hands-on. So that's what it's looking like like right at this moment. Um, so we, so at this point, that estimate, we know we have up to $100,000 to spend. Obviously, we, we don't want to spend mon that money if we don't have to, but we'll be paying people by the hour. Mm. Um, and, and we're looking at 1099s instead. So that helps us extend those dollars um, 
and hopefully not quite spend up to that much. Um, Does that answer your question? But you did say yeah, rem remote it's, option. I, it's, yeah, I, go, I was, um, yeah, go ahead. It's not that. Right. Right. No, it's so, so though those children will, will be working remotely with that tutor. Um, but far, as far as a remote option for anyone who wants to opt for that, um, that has not been um, something that we have pursued this year at all. Okay. Um, I well, guess that's what you meant, right? Um, yeah, I wasn't sure what that was going to look like. And I was just afraid that it was going to sort of take a step back, in my opinion, to uh, what the kid in the classroom's experience is like when their teacher is also teaching online simultaneously. Hold on. Yeah. Kim, and that, that's what I wanted to throw so, in, Kimberly, was who are we targeting with those two tutors? Right. The children that we're targeting with those tutors would be children that are homebound because they are either um, a home because they are COVID positive or yeah. because they are household contact. Or obviously, if someone you know, had their tonsils out, sure. for example, we would we would yeah. we would include those students. Um, as far as room and Zoom, um, I can only express from the administration's point of view. Um, the board certainly has has can answer that question for themselves, but I have been very upfront with the board that I was not comfortable um, nor felt that it would be productive to ask teachers to do that again. Yeah. Um, the teachers, it was a huge lift last year. They did a phenomenal job. It wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. We're gonna talk about that next. But asking them to do it again would be too, too much and we would lose teachers. I, yeah. Um, has there been any thought in terms of um, money in looking at the current busing situation? Um, I guess there's another question. Can I ask? An, I, well, I just asked it. Yeah. But, <laughs> you, you already <laughs> asked your follow-up. So, yeah. so, yes, you can. Uh, but I guess, you know, if, you know, all, I feel like we're doing all these mitigation strategies and the kids and their mask class, and then it's like they're crammed onto a bus for twice as long as they normally were, um, and pretty soon it's like, going to be too cold to have the windows open and it's like I, I guess I would appreciate some urgency or you know looking at that situation we live a mile and a half from school and it takes my kids 45 minutes to get home and um, you know uh, I, I, has there been any conversation about if there's like a finan potential financial solution to looking into I don't know <laughs> So um, I, I, many of you know that we, are, we hire the busing out to a contractor. Um, Amy's not here, so she can't answer specific busing questions. Um, I can tell you I have um, a meeting with the bus contractor as well as their corporate people to discuss our busing situation. It has not, it, it's not, I, honestly, it is not about money. Okay. It is about the fact that, again, unabashedly, if anyone wants to drive a bus, I will personally pay for you to get your bus driver license at this point. Um, it'll be worth the Sundays I don't have to crisis <laughs> prevent. Yeah. Um, but in all seriousness, it is about not having enough drivers. Um, and, and that it, it's, it's not about ha not having enough buses. Um, I can tell you on Sunday, where's Tim Grassi? Tim Grassi and I were trying to figure out how we were going to drive um, the food service vans to pick students up because we thought we were not going to have enough enough drivers on Monday. So um, it's that it's that bad right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Is this budget? It is. It's, it's budget. Okay. Not buses. Yes. Oh, I didn't see him. Sorry. Uh, he was in my blind spot. How you doing, Don Boyce, Peter Barrow? Uh, I've been in the district with uh, four boys for twenty years now. Uh, I'm glad I have my mask on because I can see there's some black stuff floating up here, so it's <laughs> kind of nasty, so it's kind of good to have that. That being said, um, when you guys refund money to the state, to the towns, whatever it is, to the towns, who decides that number? Do you guys sit as a board and say, this gets cut, this doesn't? Do we overestimate? What's the process? Thank you. You mean at the end of the year once we have those numbers? Yeah. So the, the, the voters, part of that is determined by what was in the warrant, right? So as Jim explained, we put different warrant articles and say, if there's money left over, will mm -hmm. you let us put $200,000 into the capital reserve fund? Will you let us put $100,000 into this trust fund? Okay. This, only if there's money left, right? Yep. So that's, that's how that works. We budget 
with a plan of having two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? That's been our target the past couple of years of unreserved money. That's okay. our cushion, if you will. Um, two hundred fifty thousand is is our plan. Okay, I'll see and then we three point four million. Right. Being yep. put back. Okay. So we so we froze the budget. Yeah. Right. First off, we froze the budget mm -hmm. um, as soon as COVID hit because we knew there would be stuff that we had unanticipated costs on. Yep. A lot of stuff didn't happen. Right. I mean, I think that's fair to say. Right. That could have happened. Right. That didn't. Um, so there was savings there. And then the feds gave us money. And so we were able to move. Lori, on a weekly basis, almost daily, was trying to identify costs that we could move into FEMA grants, ESSER grants, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, that we were able to move into those. We had $3 million in unanticipated costs, right? Is that our number? Um, as a result of COVID. We still had a surplus of $3 million. Yep. This case, I'm dead. But again, don't, don't, don't forget that we got a lot of money. Jim, you got to unmute your thing. And we didn't know what was coming. And you got to unmute. Okay. Oh. We, didn't, we didn't know how much money, it's on. We didn't know how much money we were getting and when we were going to get it, what the program was going to allow and the requirements change. I mean, Lori did a heroic job in trying oh, to keep I'm not denying of any of that. I, I'm just asking a simple question. I saw our auction a couple years past. It looked like it was 1.2 million. Yep. Well, I don't know the exact numbers. There was only a million dollars almost we were turning to sure. the towns. Yep. And my question I've heard all the time is, oh, we got to cut this. Or we can't get new teachers for this. Or we got to, the kids got to pay for sports. If we we're funding this much money, what's going on? It's kind of confusing to me. So I'm new here, yeah. um, but I think that's been coming. With the, this, I, mean, I know you tell me I can't say that anymore, but <laughs> um, so I've read 50 years worth of annual reports. It's, yeah. If you've got nothing else to do for several no, weekends, it's, it's great stuff. <laughs> um, and I think the board historically tried to make sure they always had huge returns because the towns love to get those no, huge returns. I understand right? that. Actually. And so what we've tried to do, I mean, just I just want to yeah. make it clear, yeah. the board, and we had a very candid discussion, I think the first year I was on the board was let's not like let's if you're let's just be more realistic about what that number is and then we manage to those numbers At, because again unlike a town we can't go over we can't afford to be off because then stuff absolutely gets cut right we can't issue a tax anticipation note we can't deficit spend so if we as a group of communities could actually get more on the document for voting for Let's say for fields or something like that. We wanted to get new fields in the yeah. area. We could put that in and work on that with you guys to try to get that money and voted for. Is that a process? That, I mean, that's how you got football. It took 20 years, but the football was a Warren article. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, so that, that's a good thing to know. I think that would be good for a lot of people to understand that process. Um, the other thing that would happen for me. Is that what you mean? Stuff like that, right? Yes, exactly. Another thing for like, I'm always a big proponent to get the best teachers, which is going to bring more students and bring more stuff into this area. Yep. Right now, we have only a few students or teachers who have master's degrees, you know, so that level's changing. Um, okay. Sorry, what, Dr. Ullman? Yeah, let him finish. Let him finish, then we'll address it. Okay, yeah, so I'm just wondering, so let's get more and more um, higher level teachers, you know, to get the kids more educated. And um, so... I part will tell you that part of that was very much part of our discussion on the last negotiation we had with CVEA was to make sure that our first-year teachers, What's CDEA? sorry, the Conval um, Education Asso Educators Association, the union, the teachers union, okay. was to make sure that that first-year pay yeah. was um, competitive. Mm -hmm. It's still lower than every other district exactly. around us, but, get but um, again, that's part of that process. Mm -hmm. And we did try to make sure we were being somewhat competitive to attract yeah, people exactly. People that want to teach, okay. right? So, um, so again, I don't have that, that surplus. I'm like, is there a way that, that could, we could use that somehow? Yeah, Rich. All right, so to, I think the superintendent is probably looking up an exact number for you. But okay. uh, as, sure she as is. part of that negotiating process, what I can, you know, one of the things we look at is what the negotiation is going to cost. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at the, uh, the salary schedule and how many people fall into each of the lanes in that salary schedule gotcha. all the time. And those lanes are for, you know, bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. for master's degree, so forth. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm going to have to, to challenge a bit your, your assertion that we have a low number of teachers with bachelor's degrees. That I didn't say bachelor's, with, I said master's. With master's degrees. Yeah. So that's actually not... It, it's it's a clear majority of our teachers. Oh, is it? Okay. Degree. Yeah, it's uh, uh, probably sure a super majority. Uh, I was it was informed of that information from someone else. So yeah, so so that's that's part of part of the answer there. So is what is the number then? Not true. We can get a voice. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, Excel helps. Well, that's significant then. That's good. Okay, that's good. All right, well, that's good information. So could let's I, uh, keep it going. Yeah, of course. If I could address the first half of your, your question for a moment as to why that um, returned fund balance was higher in, in past years. Um, this school board has uh, what's called the Selectman's Advisory Committee as part of um, the Articles of Agreement. Mm -hmm. And we sort of coordinate with the selectmen of the various towns <coughs> on what they wanted to see. Uh, the thing is, once you've been returning a large balance for years, to, to shift that is, is wrenching for the towns because if you've been returning a million dollars and suddenly you don't return anything, that's going to be reflected as quite a bump in the next year's tax bill. And so what we uh, did for years at the request of the selectmen was kept that number relatively stable. So it's a backroom deal, kind of? And it, well, it's not backroom a backroom deal. deal. It was discussed it, in a public meeting at the selectmen advisory. No, it is it's public. A, okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> which are all open to the public and you can attend. You just can't have comments. And, and which are all, you know, the results of which are all voted on by you. Uh, but what we've done over the last several years is we've, we've tightened that number, uh, number up. And so the, the danger in tightening that number up is what Tim's already expressed, which mm -hmm. is when you get down to $250,000 on a $52 million, $53 yeah, that's million dollar budget, that, yeah. you, you don't have a lot of, of room for error. Mm -hmm. uh, the other ninety nine. That that's a ninety nine point nine nine percent. I mean, there may be even another nine at the end yeah, of it. But that. why is that the number though that you guys came up? That seems so, really low for a fifty million dollar. So, so it is, and and as a result of that, we asked you, the voters, mm -hmm. to give us the authority to have an emergency fund balance, yep. like the towns have, okay. and that goes into effect. I always Lori is going to shoot me because she just told me this like eight times. June thirty of twenty three. July 1 of 23. So so we asked you to approve it. You did. Mm -hmm. It goes into effect then. We will be able to reserve up to 5%, but we already put a policy in place that limited ourselves to 2.5% of what's left of the assessment. Sorry. It's still low. Uh, it, again, it, but, but again, it's a reasonable step in that direction of having uh, some reserve that we would be able to fall back on that right now we don't. No, I, then you should increase it. In the so I, look, the discussion that was had the other night was was whether a, a given percentage of every year's budget should be for capital improvement by default, right? I mean, it's, those are all of the things we've tried to wrestle with over the... Might uh, help those things. So one, one more thing, if I could, yeah, Tim. So the other thing that is true is that the two largest numbers uh, returned that you saw prior to this year, which were about $1.7 million and about yeah. $1.4 million, uh, were in years after the... <clears throat> the health insurance plan uh, uh, covering most New Hampshire school districts was essentially found to have been, well, in simple terms, o overcharging uh, and had to return significant amounts of money. And so we returned it to the to the yeah. voters. So it sort of artificially increased that number for two yeah, years. Yeah, by just seeing those numbers, I was like, whoa, yeah. I got at least bring it up. Great question. Everybody good? So I also just want to... You're doing great. You want yeah. to come so you can come? There's an empty chair. That's the other piece that we're always concerned about in that 250, and that 250, it, that leaves like no no room for error. Um, it's very right. So the other thing that we have to be really careful about too is that because the two where the 250 is, it could, if we increase that number, it can at times falsely decrease the district assessment which sounds great, right? Because that every, it's the district assessment usually that people get like, oh my goodness, that, that, that's how taxes are going to go up. If we, fall, if we ever falsely deflate that number and then don't have those dollars for whatever reason to give back because it is an estimate, that, that district assessment is going to get hit really, really hard. So, so we also try to be careful that we're conservative with that number so that we don't um, over-promise and under-deliver well, with the district assessment. So noted. Yep. <laughs> yep. Please see previous comment about losses. Hey, I, 
I spent a lot of time in 40 year career in business and I learned how to spell school budget. I also learned that school budgets are completely different animals than business budgets. Okay, there's no profits. And you just mentioned there's, I think, I forget your exact words, but you kind of applied that we would have a profit. We have a lot of money to play with at the end of the year. We're not supposed to have a lot of money to play with at the end of the year. Dr. Ullman, is it about the budget or busing? It's I'm just kidding. budget. Okay, I'm just uh, <laughs> First of all, I think you, everybody should read uh, Jim Fredrickson's school budget uh, primer. When I come to a presentation like this, I can't make heads or tails of it. Uh, I have in my hand about 12 type pages of notes on Jim's, one of Jim's uh, uh, primers. Uh, two big obstacles when it comes to budgeting for education. Uh, New, Hampshire, New Hampshire state government provides the lowest amount of state aid in terms of what it costs to educate the average uh, student uh, of any state in the, in the union. I was on a, a, a school board in another state where we could rely on 55 to 60 percent of the overall district spending coming from the, the, the state capital. Uh, New Hampshire makes, in percentage terms, uh, the lowest uh, contribution. And also you should know that there's been systematic devolution. That means the state has sent down to local governments uh, financial responsibilities that have become very expensive. For instance, uh, re retirement benefits, paying for the pensions of, of municipal employees. So um, this, this school board in this district operates under uh, very tough uh, handicaps. Kimberly. And I would just um, reiterate a piece of what Dr. Ullman is talking about. The statewide portion of adequacy or what adequacy or swept does not actually come from the state. That all gets raised locally and redistributed locally. So the state does not actually provide any support to the local school district. Okay. All right. It, okay. okay, now you're good, sorry. I forgot to come back to you. It's all right, my, my statement's gonna be unpopular, so we'll... <laughs> okay. It is about budget, though. Okay, great. <laughs> Going back to Stephanie's um, comment about the $100,000, that's really not $100,000, but for the sake of the conversation, can we... I know this may sound unpopular and I'm not trying to not give the students that are out for COVID in their themselves or their family help. But given that this is a finite period of time and there, let's say there's 20 students to be generous that are out for a specified period of time, it's not possible for these students to check you know, Google Classroom and get their work off there and get paper packets home from elementary schools that would cost us zero dollars? Nothing costs us zero dollars. Okay, but that's not going to cost us extra money. I mean, like, somebody's putting back the papers that, you know, they're already printed out for the classrooms. They put them outside the elementary schools. You pick it up. You go home. These students check Google Classroom for their work if they happen to leave for sports. I mean, I I just don't understand why we're spending more money on this kind of thing. That's all. So it's no like I said, unpopular. <laughs> no, no. I just want to make clear that, that in a non-COVID environment, right, if these kids were at home, it would be homebound instruction. And instead of just sending them home with the packets, we would actually send someone to their house. That uh, really happens? Y yeah. That's called homebound instruction. Um, we can't do Have that. Have you ever, I mean... Uh, <laughs> I mean, Aaron, wow. So if you think it, it, there are students who have to be out for extended amount of time for a whole variety of reasons, um, and some, you know, some people can support their students and some people are, can't support their students. Um, so for, for instance, if a student has a terminal illness, so if they're receiving chemotherapy, there are a number of reasons that we do homebound instruction. And 10 days is just about when we would start homebound instruction for students. Pre-COVID, is that what you're saying? Pre-COVID, Pre yes. Okay, yeah. So, so the fact that we're in, in this funny 
10 days, but you know, some families, if it passes through the family, there it's more, it has us growing concerned about the progress that those students can make just with what's up on Google. And so the tutoring is, is kind of that happy medium between, what did uh, Stephanie call it, room and Zoom, and the, um, and, and just picking up your, your work to, to do independently. Okay, that, that does make sense. Well, I don't totally agree. I, it, does make more, it does make more sense. So I appreciate the answer to that question. Thank you. Thank you for your questions on the budget. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Chip, <laughs> Chip. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna move on to learning recovery. Superintendent. Yes, that's my hope. Yes. Yes, I know. Do you want to move to that? All right, so I'll put it to the body. So would you rather us go to the open forum part or the learning recovery part? I'll say open forum because we can ask questions about learning recovery during that. Sure. You can, you know. Anybody else have a problem with that? All right, so let's go to that. What? What Do you have a problem with that? You don't, but you're doing great. How about five minutes? Do it in five minutes. All right, we'll do that. All right, okay. All right. Stay late. What? Stay late, right? Yeah. Else do, right? What's what's a school meeting that's not four hours, right? Am I right, board members? Yes. Hey. Yes, Doctor. Okay. Well, well, this isn't Zoom, though. We can put boxes around our head. All right. So sure. Uh, go ahead. Have at it. No, no. We we've gone to the open forum. You can ask curriculum questions if you want. Students that don't Hold on, require... wait, wait till you're at the mic. Okay, what if you have students that don't require catch up? What are your plans for them? Anything? So we have our regular targeted block, it our would wind, just be that. Okay. wind block, and, and so those students get extension. Mm -hmm. um, but the, reco the dollars that we actually got from the federal government mm -hmm. are supposed to be targeted specifically for learning recovery. That's what I was going to ask. Thank you. But we still have our regular, at the high school, there's the task block, there's the win ones sure at the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure if we would be able to use some of that money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's extra. You mean extra? Well, like, um, let's say. Yeah. If you have, like, advanced math and oh. advanced readers. I would say, I would say, um, so not um, special programming, but our learning recovery plan um, really is a layered approach. And so a big piece of it is um, instructional coaches that we've hired to work with classroom teachers. And we're doing a lot of work around what's called acceleration. So it's not moving faster, but, but being really intentional about what are the most important things that kids need to learn and how are we using our time and being really strategic and also having a very challenge, like, like be focused on grade level standards and um, providing challenge to kids. So all the, all the research that we looked at around learning recovery, it wasn't back way up um, and remediate, but figure out how can we help kids by providing scaffolding so, and really challenging them. So, so there is a big piece around supporting teachers to become more effective, which should help all students. Okay, uh, sure. Again, uh, who you are, where you're from. Mackenzie, Peterborough. Um, I just have a question on, we've all probably heard about uh, discussion of legislation in the state of not allowing um, remote learning. Um, if that does happen, and maybe you're aware of some more updates on it, where does that stand? Maybe if you know anything. Um, and also, if that does happen, does that change our color coding, yep. blue, green, yellow? So song? it's a regulatory change. So it's not even a statute. Um, okay. Right now in the current education, regulations, we would have the authority to move to uh, remote periods. 
they are closing that option off by taking away that part of local control and says that we can't. So yes, then we'd have no choice but to figure out what what, okay. what that next phase is. And be. have we thought about how that would affect the color right. situation? So, so like if we had the numbers that right now would put us in red, which right. would mean it's not safe to be in school. Well, red is different. So red would likely mean an order from the governor or something okay. so severe that we would close. Okay, so even so, yellow. Uh, the, question is, the question would really be what's the impact on yellow if we lose the ability to go remote? Okay. And there has there been discussion of that yet or are we I waiting? mean so arguably we wouldn't be compliant, right? If, if we if we went down that road if the right. state says we can't do it. So I, that's all I got for you at this okay. point. But that's a regular it's a regulatory action that they're trying to take as soon as they realized we could do that, they moved to close it. Even though they reviewed our plan and approved it. Yes. Hancock Elementary. Sure. Um, I haven't investigated the budgets very deeply. I will try to find time to do that. Um, I wonder if you could explain to me a little bit about the choice to have a shared principal there. Personally, the, I want to give the school a big chance this year. We've had a lot of change, and I appreciate all the complexity that you guys have described. Um, however, having a shared principal who is on site a lot less my impression is that there's a lot less communication and synchronicity between the information that's shared, not just between parents in school, but amongst the people in the school. I'm getting different information from different people. Um, I also feel like there's a bigger gulf between parents and the school compared to previous to COVID, and maybe that's true across all schools. I'm not sure, but I know it's true in Hancock, and that's not just my opinion. That's when I've discussed with other parents as well. Um, I really fell in love with the school and we started out just pre-COVID. Um, I'm still in love with the school, but I'm a little concerned with the lack of communication, the shared principal not always being on site, lack of communication on when we're gonna have different events between the parents and the school, dates changing and not being communicated. Could we talk about why is there a shared principal? Is that planning on being changed and any other information relevant to that? Uh, sure. I mean, so at one point, this board and the district looked at what it, what was the um, I forget how we phrased it, sort of the minimum the minimum load at every one of the community schools, right? And it was something like it takes seven, regardless of how many kids are in that school, it takes seven professionals just to stand up that school. And so that was part of the discussion, and the administration proposed moving to a shared principal model between Hancock and uh, DCS. And the board approved that request. As to whether that moves forward or not, that would be part of the, the budget process every year as to what that next thing looks like. And that's all part of what we do now based on the budget workshop that'll occur in the first weekend in November. Sorry, Kimberly, go ahead. So um, just to, to piggyback on that, so DCS and Hancock, um, well, they don't feel super geography geographically close, they are closer than some other places. Um, so we, we have a shared principal model between Francistown and Bennington, and we moved to that model um, in Hancock and Dublin. Just to be clear, I am so glad to hear that it felt like Amy was there all the time, but Amy actually was also, Amy Janik is the previous Hancock principal. Amy also was a writing coach, so she she, she was splitting her time between Hancock and other buildings um, and, and coaching teachers um, in the process of, in literacy and or writing. Um, so it wasn't a stretch for us to say, okay, if we've, we've had somebody who has really been a part-time administrator, we'll move to somebody splitting part-time only just as an administrator versus a coach and a an administrator, which the the Amy and some of the other people who had been doing that role said was really very um, was really too difficult. I will speak to Nicole, who is the new Hancock principal, about communication from from your feedback and let her know that there are some concerns. Um, what might be happening is is the difference between. Amy's style and her style and her just getting her feet under herself in a new building. So, but I will, I will definitely speak to Nicole about that. Anyone else? Yes. Yep. Go ahead. Who you are, where you're from. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Julia Beam, and I live in Hancock, and I have a son at Conval. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read this just because I did prepare this, and I and I want to share um, some information with everyone. I have uh, I do have a couple of questions. First of all, though, I would like to thank the school board for having this forum. Uh, I think it's great. I think it's really important for everyone to be able to stay in communication and discuss issues. And um, so I do have a couple of questions. One is related to masks and the other is related to budget. Um, but again, I'd like to share a little background information first to provide some context for my questions. Um, back in June, my husband and I wrote a letter to the Conval School Board and to Superintendent Saunders. Um, our letter was urging you to make masking optional in the Conval School District. Uh, because we feel that students and their parents or guardians should be the ones to make the decision as to whether students wear a mask or not. Um, during the pandemic, there's been something we've all heard, the constant refrain to follow the science, which we totally agree with. Um, the problem is that uh, we feel that the Condal, Conval School District has been following basically our health authorities who are not following the science. And uh, decades of the best scientific evidence, meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials have shown unequivocally that face masks do not reduce viral transmission. The randomized controlled trials were done on influenza-like viruses, and it was found that the viral particles are too small and they go right through the masks. The SARS-CoV-2 virus is even smaller in size than the influenza virus. So the data can apply to SARS-CoV-2. And I can provide those scientific studies if you'd like. And in fact, Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, originally stated that masks were not effective against SARS-CoV-2, which is in line with the decades of research. He later changed his position based on a new meta-analysis of a handful of studies. Uh, my husband and I looked at those studies, none of which were randomized controlled trials. They were retrospective observational studies, which are the weakest form of scientific evidence because they are correlational. So one has to ask why Anthony Fauci shifted his position on mask wearing based on such weak scientific data over against the decades of randomized controlled trials. Not only are masks ineffective against the transmission of COVID-19, but they can increase the risk of developing a respiratory illness by causing arterial oxygen deprivation, also known as hypoxia, which reduces innate immunity. And wearing a mask for even just a minute or two raises carbon dioxide levels to over 10,000 parts per million. OSHA's recommendation is a maximum of 5,000 5, parts per million of carbon dioxide over an eight-hour eight hour workday, and our children are wearing these masks for six to seven hours a day. Masks can also increase infection risk by becoming a breeding ground for bacteria, viruses, and fungi that are already in the body and then are exhaled via the breath and get caught in the masks. And the masks worn for extended periods of time become warm and moist, which is the perfect greeting ground for these microorganisms. There are also many negative psychological and physiological impacts from wearing masks. Reduced oxygen can lead to headaches, fatigue, anxiety, and a decline in cognitive functioning, such as focus and memory. Face masks can significantly impair communication, social connectedness, and student psych psychological well-being. And when the brain isn't getting enough oxygen, its functioning is affected altogether, including the areas of the brain that regulate mood. There's been an increase in psychological issues and even suicides in children and teens during the pandemic. CDC data showed a 24% increase in emergency room mental health visits for children ages 5 to 11 compared to 2019. Among adolescents ages 12 to 17, that increase is 31%. Last summer, the CDC reported that one in four young adults had contemplated suicide in the previous month. Finally, I'd like to emphasize that our children are not at great risk from COVID-19. Based on CDC data, 
the risk of children between the ages of zero and 19 years of age dying from COVID-19 is an incredibly low risk of 0.003%. The risk of adults under the age of 49 dying from COVID is 0.02%. And the risk of adults under the age of 69 dying from COVID is 0.5%. These statistics would include most or all of the staff in the Conval school system as well. With such a low risk from COVID, how is taking all of these risks associated with having our children wear masks justifiable? This past week, students at Conval in health and wellness and physical education classes were required to wear masks during physical fitness activities while they are breathing hard with an elevated heart rate. This is especially dangerous and is absolutely unacceptable. So I have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, related to masking. Since masking is causing damage to our children by reducing their oxygen supply, increasing carbon dioxide levels, increasing their exposure to pathogens, and psychologically harming them, I would like the Conval community to be provided with the references for the scientific studies on which you're basing your decision to mask our children. Uh, we did that in my last post that we posted on our website. We gave you the um, uh, National Academy, the uh, Society of the sorry, the National Academy of Sciences uh, published a fairly extensive evidence review of that. Okay, I will. I mean that there's at least that. that. If you look at all of the stuff we got much earlier on in this process from the COVID monitoring team, they gave us pages of citations, but. Uh, the National okay, Academy. and is it all, it's all on the school board's website? Yeah, uh, the one that references the National Academy of Sciences definitely is. I'm not sure if the materials from the COVID team are up there or not, but there was a whole bunch of citations in one of the ones we got from them, too. Okay, I will take a look at that. And my second question is related to budget. I want to know, has the Conval School District received, or is it slated to receive, any state, federal, or private funding and or grants from any entity on the condition of universal masking, vaccinating, or any COVID-related protocols for students or staff in the Conval School District? You mean to date? We uh, don't know what grants we get in the future. No, I mean, I mean, are you in possession of the money now or no. are you scheduled to get it? Well, again, that's a, so I, none of I it, can't tell you what we're going to get in the future because that doesn't exist yet. But we don't have any now that require that, no. Is that your question? My is question there talk is- talk of it to who? I, I'm not the federal, I, we're not, none of us, what, sorry again? The answer is no. no. You're not getting any funding that says you, you're taking this money, but you're required to universally mask none of our and money vaccinate us. None of the money we have says that. So there's no strings attached to any None of the, the money. money says that. Okay. All right, those are my two questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name's Kim. I live in Peterborough, and I have two boys here at Conville. Again, thank you for this time, and also everybody that's here. I think um, the input, the discussion has been great. Um, our, uh, athletics. I don't fully understand how that's funded, but I think that as parents, we do a lot of fundraising for these athletics. And I was disappointed in the lack of communication around homecoming and it being postponed and that how that all came forward. I don't, you know, I heard it from students and my students and never really got anything official or I don't recall seeing that. So if we could approve upon that, that would be great. And I don't really have a good understanding of the fields that we have to use um, for our athletic events, but it seems like every time we have a heavy rain or something happens, we can't use our fields. And looking at things, we got great facilities, but it just seems like a lot of times, you know, we can't use them for good events. And, you know, hearing about this surplus and the money we give back, it would just be nice to see if we could invest in those and improve them for our students, because I think that's been an ongoing issue. So that's kind of my question, thought. Thank you. Thanks. I, I'll tell you, I honestly don't know enough about the athletic fields to answer any of those questions. So, so I, Mr. Grassi is in the back, the facilities oh yeah. director. Well, I don't know. Sure, Come if you got down. one. Come on down. 
Unless you're going to ask me to drive a mower. Do you have to do it so the lot, the people at home can hear you? In a nutshell, we play the cards that were dealt. Um, the athletic fields are different throughout the schools. Uh, they're different at the high school. The lower field is a newer field that's got a different uh, spline for drainage in it, and it drains extremely extremely well. The stadium field uh, is a crown-based field that has uh, drainage around the exterior of it, inside of the track. Uh, I can tell you there's an eight inch line that goes out the hill, the other side of the scoreboard, that's got about that much water. It's been pouring out of it since the middle of July. Um, uh, there's about 12 inches of loam on it. It's like a sponge. It's only gonna take so much, and then it's gonna hold it, it's gonna retain it. When you have an August, uh, when you have a July that put 19 and a half inches of rain on it, you have an August that put uh, two or three inches more than average in a September that has given us twice the amount of rain that we normally get. It can't take it. Um, I've heard, you know, the, I've heard from the kids, you know, the field is always wet. Well, it's, it's not true. Um, generally during the spring, because of our geographical location, you know, we try to push back the events a heavy snowfall, uh, you know, a, a late snowfall, colder temperatures, we have to postpone games that are supposed to be held here in, in April. Um, to my knowledge, I think we've had four or five games that have actually been postponed on the field in the last five years. One of them, we had five inches of snow. In October, we canceled the middle school uh, game so that they wouldn't dig the field up for one of the first home soccer playoff games that we would have had in years. Um, it's not from a lack of, of effort or expertise. Um, we play the cards that were dealt. Uh, we've done deep tine aeration. We've done, we've put soil conditioning on the field. Um, but again, hate to say it is what it is, but we've pretty much got what we've got. Um, in order to, if we wanted to peel that all off, go to a different field, surface, substrate with drainage, you know, a different uh, porosity of, of aggregate underneath the loam, you get $150,000 an acre. So um, to put a turf field out there, which a lot of our you know, uh, competitors have now, uh, it's about a million dollars and I need about $80,000 worth of equipment to maintain it. And that's not a set it and forget it. Um, there's a lot of things that go behind that as well. So um, anybody wants to donate some money, I'll gladly take it. <laughs> um, but that's what we've got. And I hope I've answered your question. Thanks, Tim. Can I Go ahead. Make a comment? Sure. You know, just Can you step up to the mic so the nice people at home? I like to imagine no, there's I, I like to imagine there's actually people watching at home. So. <laughs> no, I think they are. Okay. Um, that makes me feel better. You know, Thank you. From, I just wonder what the board's sense of you know, we we're hearing that now this vaccine's gonna be widely available for kids five and up within the next couple of weeks here. Like, at what point is it like from a policy standpoint, like your job is done in terms of you know, choices that are about the health, you know, healthcare choices that parents should be making. You know, like I have a kid who's struggles a lot and has not really ever received targeted math intervention. And I have another kid who's bored out of her mind and really not happy going to school anymore because all she hears about is COVID and masks and is terrified to sneeze because she'll be sent home. You know, like at what point can we shift our focus back on education? And like improving our sports facilities. Like it's time to get back in our lane. And like I'm hearing people talk about, you know, like is zero COVID the end game here? Because it's never going to happen. No, 80%. We've, we've, never, we've never said that. I know you didn't say that. I'm talking like maybe it's hyperbole, but like at what point are we just going to say, you know, people have been high risk and immunocompromised every flu season. Yeah, yeah. This is not something new. Yeah. It's never going to go away. And at, at one point, is it like, you know what? Like, parents can assess the risk, you know, get their kid the vac vaccines are great, right? Like, they're effective and awesome. But, like, at some point, like, when do we get back in our lane as educators and focus on education and stop? Like, I, you don't care about my kid more than I do. I can promise you that. You know, when it, when it comes down to, like, making decisions about their bodies... Like when does this end? when does this end? Because I cannot believe we are a third. Like our kids have not had a normal school year for three years. 
Like at what point, I know you can't answer when is this over, but like, is there any sense of when this is over? When the vaccine's available? Like, are we gonna keep following these guidelines from people who couldn't find Peterborough on a map? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure what that. Federal government, CDC, like, I mean, come on. When does this end? But, which answer do you want to that? I, I don't think you want the answer. <laughs> well, we know. I just no, want to know, like, making decisions. So, so first thing to prove, I mean, like, we're sitting here in a room together, like, yeah. what is the sense of... So, again, the state has made very clear, if you're talking specifically about masks, yeah. if a building gets to a verified vaccination rate of 80%, the masks can come off. Yeah, okay, I... What do you mean, I where's just, the science behind can, what? Go, Leah, go. Behind what? That's for almost for almost. <laughs> go ahead. I'll let you go first since you're at the mic. Leah Seymour. I uh, live in Peterborough, and I have um, three children in the district. And my question is: I understand the eighty percent is a suggestion, That's and a it's a suggestion, sure. correct? Sure. Okay. So it's a suggestion that 80, once we get to eighty percent, we can lose the mass. Yeah. When it comes down that they five and older can get have the access to the vaccination. If we don't have 80% of students whose parents are willing to vaccinate them, yep. but everyone has the option, yep. but parents are making the choice for their children saying, I feel like the risk of COVID is lower than the risk of taking a vaccine that has not been, you know, here, for years. here forever. For whatever reason, they made the choice for their child that they do not believe that their risk of COVID is higher than the risk of the vaccine. Are we going to continue to wear masks, even though they've had the option, but they prefer not to have their child vaccinated? Good question. I think that's what people are saying is that, yes, 80%, but at what point are we going to be allowed to make the choice for our children and allow others to make the choice for their children? Sure. So, not have to make it for everybody. Tim? Yeah. Rich? So uh, I, I think we're, we're focusing a little bit too much on the 80% here and not the, the fact that there is another way where we end up with no masks. And that is when uh, the rate of infections per 100,000 people drops below 100. So when you're, when you're asking, and that is, you know, 100 per 100,000 is, is way more than zero. We're not talking about zero COVID when you're talking about that. So really that's, but I, I in think the immediate I, future, that's probably the answer is when the and, rate falls. Down. And I can respect that. And I think, you know, the rate falling is great, too. I just am looking at also all the other protocols, like as far as social distancing and um, limiting the number, like just all the protocols that we have in place, not just masks. Are those protocols ever going to go away? So, the, so look, I'll, I'll go back to Messenic. I'll use my Messenic example of, you know, not surprisingly, you take the masks off, the cases back go. And so until that levels out and we decide, and people have a discussion about what, what that number is, that's when you can have the rest of those discussions. And I, think, I, I can't predict. Like, no, and I'm not asking. We're at 240. I'm, look, I told you, if that number's right and we're at 242, that's a massive change from a week ago. That's absolutely trending in the right direction and hopefully it's below 100 and we can go back to no mass and i think that's great and i'm not asking you to give an answer i'm just simply Fair. voicing where i think the frustration is coming from from parents who would like the choice for their children is that at some point we feel like we're never going to have that choice again because it's getting to the point where you feel like I don't want to have my children vaccinated and I don't want them wearing masks. When do I, when can I make those choices for them and not be taking care of everybody else who's had the option to get the vaccine and had the option to wear a mask if they choose to. So I think that's where the frustration is. Oh, sorry. Hi. <laughs> Hiding in the corner. Um, Emily from Francistown again. Um, for those of you who are interested in knowing how optional masking plays out, take a look at the data from Texas. Um, so mask mandates are not allowed in Texas. Um, so some school districts have gone against the governor's order and had mask uh, mandates in their school districts. Um, the school district where we were in Texas, our superintendent and school board did nothing. Masks are optional. 
Um, and there have been more COVID cases in the last six weeks that school has been in session than there were for the entire school year last year. In our neighborhood elementary school, at one point three weeks ago, one in 20 kids had active cases. Um, and that's a gross underrepresentation. They're, but they're not because the kids around them are not. So. Okay, okay look, 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 hey, this is, so, sorry, so hold on. Sorry, so, community so, forum, board, you're coming, board, I'm not be between each other, because that's not gonna go anywhere. So let's um, be a little bit more productive. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate Thanks. that. Um, so anyway, I mean, the, the data are all publicly available. The school districts have trackers, so I'd encourage you to take a look at those data, and you can see that optional masking really doesn't work. Um, and for school districts that have had really high COVID cases, um, some of them have implemented mask mandates, you know, during those brief times where COVID cases have heightened, and then cases have gone down. Um, so there's evidence that masking does work, and it's one layer of the Swiss cheese, as was presented at the beginning of the night. Um, so it's one preventative measure. Um, and I think the thing to think about, too, is, you know, if you're exposing kids and putting them at risk, you know, thinking about the other people in their family, whether it be grandparents or other folks who are immunocompromised, this really isn't like the flu. Um, the flu doesn't clog hospitals on an annual basis. Um, so, again, um, speaking from data that have been coming out of other states in which COVID cases have been really high, I mean, I think we're very fortunate here where we really haven't had these situations that have been happening elsewhere in the country. Um, and so I think it's important to be mindful of that and to try to think of this as a, as a community issue and that we're trying to keep each other safe. So thank you, I appreciate the time. Thanks. Wait, hold on, Diana, wait. Yep. Only because you, did you, because you talked earlier. Is there anyone that hasn't said something yet that wants to? Sorry, where? Okay, sir. And then I'll go back to you, Diana. Sorry, what? It's not someone else. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. I just want to make sure people that haven't gotten a chance to speak yet before we wrap up. Change of topic, back to budget. Sure. Um, so I really appreciate um, presentations like that to see all the teacups that you hold up in the air. I have been amazed. My, oh, I'm Chris McCall. I'm from Peterborough. I have three boys, um, one still in Convalt who have graduated. Um, started at PES all the way up. So they, um, so I'm always amazed that you can do that. I know you follow all the regulations. You keep us out of lawsuits. We appreciate that. That's awesome. <laughs> you do a great job. We see the end product and where it's going. Um, I'm really distressed at the high school and what's happening to the guidance department. We're down to three guidance counselors for all those kids. Um, talk about the huge mental health needs and we're, we're just cutting down. Um, I see that in the classroom. Our calculus class has an amazing teacher who can handle this, but we're now 30 kids in that classroom where normally it was about 10 to 12. So the question is, as you go forward, I should say it's more of a wish when you go forward with a strategic planning process is to really start thinking about where are we going as a district academically because I'm not seeing it going in the upward motion and that's really distressing. The other thing I wish is, you know, hearing from folks who I think this group mainly has elementary school, you know, probably a mix of things. I feel very distant from that and I, I hear people say we are Conval and I'd like to see some of that in the strategic plan too. Like how can we really make our problems in each of the schools and not just pictures of like happy kids in each each school. It's nice to see the cute little kids. It's nice to see things going on, but I don't really feel connected to everybody else. The schools feel very siloed. And so how to break that up going forward. So those are just wishes. Going ahead, no, nothing to go forward. Thanks. Uh, wait, where'd he go? There was someone, and then, and then Diane. Diane. What time is it? And then we're close to the end. I'll be I'll be quick. I just I you know thank you for this. Obviously, there's there's, I mean there's a million opinions everywhere. I mean there's there's information everywhere on all the. I'm Ross from Peterborough. I have uh, uh, one daughter in in the school district. Um, you know uh, what I just keep going back to, and I want to make sure everybody's safe. And and but you know going back to, you know just the the kind of the common sense stuff when you start looking at the science, which I you know, I'm kind of sick of listening to that, non, you know, that saying all the time, but, you know, the, the risks, you know, and the benefits for all this stuff is just not really, you know, it's not really adding up, um, you know, the, 
you know, like you said, we're going to have it for, this is going to go on for a long time because it's, you know, it's, it's similar to the flu. It's not like the, it's not exactly like the flu, but it's like, so when is it going to be over and when we can, you know, take into account HHS and all this other information that we get from the school and that, and then, you know, when the questions of, you know, is any of our funds regulated by any of these guidelines that we do, it's a valid question because, you know, we have to cover everybody, but, you know, when can we kind of get out of that and really start to see, um, you know, normalcy again when, when especially it doesn't, you know, thank God it doesn't affect student or kids, school children, age kids, like the, like the elderly adult, like the elderly adults. So it's, it's, you know, when they're, they need to get their education and I, one of my student, uh, child has speech problems and so I'm just completely upset about the mass thing because they can't see the, you know, it's just very visual, very hands-on, very everything. So, I mean, and, um, and like when England, you know, the UK, and they've had cases a lot worse than the different variants and everything, and uh, their Secretary of Education came out saying primary and secondary schools don't need to wear a mask because, you know, the, the, the risks don't outweigh the, you know, the benefits. So it's like I just want to kind of know and when this is going to be over and everything else, which obviously we don't know, but I mean, I just want to keep your guys' mind open when things kind of get going and when you look at cases, you know, you, you talk about specific cases, you know, um, in the general Mananoc area or greater Mananoc area. But, you know, again, that's that's cases. You know, I know you look at possible hospitalization rates, but that's more important than just cases. You know, it's cases, cases, but like we're going to have cases forever. So it's like, let's just kind of, when is it going to just be, you know, we've learned so much in the last year and a half and we're continuing to learn more. And I just think that we have to make sure that we're on the forefront and kind of make sure we get out of that. So it's just a, just a plan forward, I guess. So, so thank you. And I think you'll probably be the last yeah. one. Directed um, at us, not them. So um, not a question Sorry, that I personally probably am interested in, but it might be one that other people are interested in. Would the COVID vaccine be required, similar no. to other vaccines that public school children need to take, such as polio, mumps, rubella, whooping cough, and that, vaccines like that? That would take the state legislature, because it's in, or the regs. I forget if it's in, I think it's in both, actually. It's in both the RSA and Ed 300-something. I almost know them all now. It's disturbing. Um, but yeah, that would take state action. That's not something we can do. Sorry, you get, anyone else that hasn't spoken? Go ahead. Sorry, wait. Sorry, I couldn't see you. Sorry, you can go next. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, Lois Hesterbrook from uh, Town of Sharon. Uh, had two kids go through the district many moons ago. I have a curriculum uh, question. It's come to my attention that a program, uh, the New Hampshire Dance Institute, has been cut in... Uh, Great Brook and South Meadow uh, schools this year. This is a program that's existed for the past 35 years, uh, served hundreds of kids in the uh, district. And I'd like to know why the uh, program was cut and when can we get it going again? Uh, sure, good question. I don't know that I have an answer to that. <laughs> so the program hasn't run because because we weren't able to bring other people in, but I, I just double checked with Lori, um, and that, as far as that is not, those dollars have not been cut from the budget. So, so that means uh, we. Hold on, she's coming up to tell me something. <laughs> no, you're wrong, or something like that. <laughs> so, so that, that was right. <laughs> so that was that was added. That was, that, yes, no. So that was added back once we were out. So that's something that's back in the budget. So it will happen this year. So it will happen this year. Um, that will that will be up to the principals. Uh, they're, they're they've been a little busy. Just to give you an idea, but we, we get a positive case in 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 a school, and that's half of the principal's day right there at that point because they do some significant contract tracing. But those the principals will be able to. Um, look at that. So. Okay. Well, I do know the... Uh, the money is available. Okay. Well, I do know the uh, New Hampshire Dance Institute has run, through COVID, uh, some very successful 
programs and they're very conscientious about um, keeping kids safe. Uh, so I can assure you that if we can get the programs back, <laughs> they're going to run very effectively without a lot of danger. <laughs> Thanks. Hold on, wait. Hi, I'm Colleen. And then, um, like, is there like one more? Because it's already past nine. Mine's and, a quick, okay. I have a quick question, and it's actually not related to anything specific. I um, actually went through the Conval District, had two children who went through the Conval District, and now have grandchildren in the elementary schools. And I spent many nights sitting at school board meetings throughout the time that my children were in the district and loved the rapport that was back and forth between the board and the audience. Um, and I, I'm kind of sad Dick Dunning's not here because I sat next to him almost every night. When did it change and why did it change? Sorry, what? I, again, I, I'm not allowed to say I'm new here, but I've only okay. been here for three years, so. I, I was, I You mean like the public comment yeah, just at a the, board meeting? Yes, exactly. The rapport and the way that a school board meeting is run now is very different than it was 10 years ago. And I just wondered why it changed. Does anybody know? <laughs> I, I haven't been here long enough to know what it was like then, but so, it, maybe. Kimberly and I can maybe take up on the last this one. one. I mean, in, in terms of when, the answer is three years ago. And in terms of why, it was a result of uh, legal guidance received by school districts and towns after several uh, lawsuits arising from public comment at, not us. at meetings. Not, not us. Not us. But, uh, you know, that's, that's what happened. Is several years ago, there were several lawsuits against uh, some towns in the Lakes region um, regarding public comment. And the New Hampshire Municipal Association, the New Hampshire School Board Association provided guidance to boards in saying, essentially, you, you have obligations to keep public comment in certain bounds. And that's, that's when it changed the mind. OK, I appreciate that answer. I just want to share, um, I, to, to make you feel better, Tim, I do, I feel, I, I I do feel watch, fine either way. I do watch oh, from okay, home. OK, good. OK? How's, is, is, it, is the clarity all right, except that we don't unmute our mics? Yep. OK. Um, and I just would say that as a society, and this goes to the board and it also goes to the audience, we can do so much better. Um, we're leading by example for our children. And the way that the dialogue and the lack of the dialogue, and in my opinion, borderline rudeness, it just isn't a good example. And I just think we can, there were a few board members who at a few of the meetings I was watching would say, could we just give a little background for the audience? To re and they would remind, I think it's important that you guys keep that in your mind. There are those of us that are trying to follow, that are trying to understand, and it sounds very cold when, don't talk to them, or you talk to me. And I just, I, and, I, and I don't, and I think the public needs to be the same way. I'm just saying, we don't need to argue, but we need to be civil. And, and I just would urge you to keep that in mind. I've, I've tried to be civil at every opportunity during those meetings, but we have the rules Mr. in Chair, place for a reason. Yeah. I would just respectfully request that the staff that are here oh, yeah. be allowed to go home. <laughs> this will be the last question. And then everybody else can go home, too. Thanks. Hi, my name is Heather, and I have had two kids go through the, um, I'm from Greenfield, have had two kids go through the district um, and graduate, and I have three left still in the district. Um, I'd like to talk again about the athletic field, Mr. Grassi. So I don't agree with the statement of there only being like four or five games that have been disrupted. Um, my son played for the football team back in 2016, 17, and 18. And there were many times that that field had to be shut down and games had to be moved. And then this year, the same thing in a couple years past, the soccer team was playing their championship game and it had to be moved to a different school district. And I, my understanding, so I've only been in this here for six years. And my understanding is that this field is new. It's there shouldn't be anything wrong with it, but yet we're going to schools that their fields are worse conditioned than ours. 
because we can't play on our field for a home game. It's just not fair to our students. It's not fair to the parents that have to then change their whole schedule and then try to get their kid to a game or get an away, if you're a parent that has to sign up for an away game snack, now your kids don't have an away game snack because it was supposed to be a home game. So my question is, has the board discussed any of this? Is there a plan moving forward? And if there isn't, could you guys start discussing it and there be a plan moving forward for our students that are coming up behind all of the students that are going through the high school now? So it hasn't been on a recent agenda. It is part of all facilities stuff is all part of the strategic plan and there's athletics and co-curriculars in addition to facilities as part of that discussion. So and that's going to that strategic plan process should be done by June and that'll inform the next five years. So so that's sort of where that stands. Mm -hmm. Specifically about it this year, there hasn't been really any discussion until um, it was raised yeah, mostly I just after think there's been a huge hardship, not only for obviously sure. the school, but also for the parents, for the students to have to shift. I mean, yep. we played a game in Monadnock because we couldn't play here. We played a game on a Thursday night in Pelham when it rained in Pelham on Thursday night when we could have played here on Friday night. It didn't rain at all. I mean, it's it's a lot for parents. And then communication, it has not not always been the best either. So. Jim? Jim? If I can address the question generally, one of the things we've tried to do in the Budget and Property Committee is get the list of things we need to do to the school. Some classrooms need paint, some need uh, modernization, we need some better fields, we need, a, I'm surprised nobody said anything about the parking lot you're going to drive across getting out of here, right? <laughs> gravel, we're going back to gravel, Football right? fields are more exotic than parking lots, but parking lots are important too. So we have a list. The list is this big. Our appetite is bigger than the list, and our funding is smaller, a lot smaller. So we've got a prioritization we need to go through, and one of the things you're going to see, not this March, but March 23, is a bond. We're going to ask the voters to approve a bond to take on, I don't know, five, ten million dollars worth of improvements that we need to do that we can't do through the normal funding process. Uh, is if, if you're really interested in the football field, you know, quality, and you don't think it's good, then you can you can voters can initiate a, what is petition warrant article. You can petition to put a warrant article, have everybody in the district vote on whether they want to spend that. What is it, ten million and a half on the field? Whatever the number is, <laughs> whatever the number is, that there's, there is a process to to do that. And you're more than welcome to attend our budget and property meetings. And I, I believe the, the list that, that we're in the process of updating, we've, we've asked him to update near term for fiscal year 23. We've got that budget in front of us. The next couple years, that would be included in the bond. And then further beyond that, what is the classroom look, you know, supposed to look like 10 years from now? Uh, we don't know the answer to those questions, but it's going to cost money, mm -hmm. and we've got limited amount of money. We're always balancing what we need to do, what we want to do for education, for facilities, and what the taxpayers are willing to pay. There's a lot of taxpayers in this district that don't have kids in the school. Thanks, Jim. All right, so it's 913, so I'm going to call it a night, 914. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank um, you. Thank you to the board. Thank you to the staff members that stayed. We'll do it again. Have a good night.